first I want to talk I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of an overview of Psalm 23 and then dive into that second part of Psalm uh, of verse 2 which is he leads me beside still waters and and what that might mean to us how that might pertain to us um and and see if we can pull that apart a little bit uh I, first thing I want to do though is look at John 14 and look at some of the language of Jesus, which is always a good thing to look at. And uh, so, like I said, I just want to offer some thoughts um, as you wrestle with a snow day today, delight in a snow day today. And uh, John 14, where Jesus says, um, uh, verse 23, 14, 23. Let me just move this so I can... Put my Bible right here. And Jesus says, this is where he's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the Father, he and the Father making themselves known to the believer and coming and manifesting themselves to him. So we can we can start at uh, verse, let's start at verse 21. Um, and it says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not the bad one, uh, uh, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, this is verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. So um, the and and he you know he he goes on in talking about John in John fourteen fifteen and sixteen about the manner in which the Father and Son will make their home in you is through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, so when there's a couple different things about this passage that I think directly pertain to or I can see uh, Psalm twenty three helping us understand. Um, the first one is the that it's this is interesting something I just learned recently is that the word in verse 23 for home is where we actually get our word monastery from so it's the word monet and it means um to to live alone which is where you know eventually if you look up the etymology of the word monastery that's where it comes from so not only is he saying that we'll make a home with you but we'll make a a set apart place where we live inside you. And so if you think about the connotations of why we th what we think about a monastery, it's set aside, it's silent, it's still, it's a place of quiet repose, it's a place where we know where we would go to, uh, uh, to have an encounter with the Father. As you guys know, I like, I have some friends in Nova Scotia, I go to their monastery about once a year. And the elders, we've done a retreat to a Catholic monastery. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus has in mind a particular monastery, but there's a reason why that word took on the connotation, eventually, of a silent, quiet repose. Jesus says, we'll make our home with you. We'll make our silent, quiet repose in you. So one is, another thing to understand is that Jesus says, we will make our home in you. So he intends to forge something in you that is a dwelling place for him. So it's not just that they will dwell in you, but he's going to send the Holy Spirit into your heart to create within your to create within each one of us a habitation for his presence. And so when it's interesting when you think about it, at the outset of the spiritual life, when the Father reveals himself, you know, you say the prayer, you're saved, you start getting in, in, involved in community, your heart is not a home for him. You know, there's there's chaos, there's war, there's all kinds of inner turmoil going on. And as you follow God for some length of time, you know, hopefully that starts to subside. I know many of you have stories about the Father encountering you. He begins to terraform the inner landscape of your heart because he intends to make a resting place for him. And Jesus says it right here. We will come and make, create, we will do homeworking within you. The Holy Spirit's going to come to you. Is going to forge something within you where the Holy, where the Father and uh, where the Spirit can rest, where the Trinity can rest, right? Where they can abide, and it's going to be a place of silent repose. It's going to be a place set apart for Him. 
and uh, and so that on the journey that's a working out your salvation with fear and trembling that's the con the concept of sanctification where over time God forges within you this dwelling place for him and you become more and more tangibly aware of his presence not at any not at all times but you're aware that there's something other than you now living your life through you and you know their conviction comes you know that's one of the first signs of a conviction comes you're like well what I used to be able to get away with I can't get away with anymore and um uh, and then we can wrestle with conviction and condemnation because the enemy tries to confuse us, tell you you're always this way. Conviction tells you when you did this thing that was wrong. But so conviction comes and begins to forge something resilient within you. Tenderness starts to come. Prayer starts to happen within you without you realizing it. You become aware of his presence. And uh, the spirit starts praying within you, as Romans 8 says. We don't even know what to pray, and the spirit groans, giving utterance to the thing that's dwelling within and so he's forging all this stuff within you, right? And so what we see, this promise of the, the coming of the Spirit to forge within you a dwelling place, Psalm 23 actually lays out what are the, what is the tendency of the, or what is the abode within you like that he's forging? That's Psalm 23. The abode within you is, I'll have no wants. Why? Because he's going to be dwelling within me, right? We can go all the way back to the, to the Beatitudes where, I'm, when I'm needy, I recognize he's what I want. And so when I have no wants means I've recognized that he's my source. And so his abode is being forged in me because he's within me, right? When he leads me beside uh, her, he makes me lie down in quiet pastures. But that's the kind of house that he lives in in our heart. He makes our house quiet. And then we can lay, we can lay down and listen to him. He leads me beside still waters. Uh, he restores my soul. All these things are kind of the measurement of what the house of God inside of you looks like, the abode he's made in you. So Psalm 23 really lays out the characteristics of what it looks like as the spirit abides and rest in your heart. And this is the promise of Jesus in John 14, that the, the, he and the father, we're going to, they're like master craftsmen going into your inner world and saying, we're going to make something where we can actually live here. When you're saved, and you come to know him, there's not a resting place for him. And he goes, well, that's okay, right? That's what Jesus is saying here. That's okay. You, all you have to do is love me. You just love me and we'll do our work. Okay, we'll tell you what it's gonna look like, right? Do, listen, obey me, do my commands, listen to me and look at the kind of ways that I talk about living. So it's okay, you know, you're not, your abode's not right right now, but we're going to make it right. But this is, he talks a lot about actually a dwelling place when he talks about you know, we have to bind the strong man and kick the strong man out of the house, right? We got to do all these things to prepare you to be a resting place. Well, Psalm 23 lays out what a resting place for him looks like. So let's turn, let's go back to Psalm 23. We're going to jump around a little bit like we always do when I'm talking. I think you guys tend to like that. I try and make scripture make sense because it should make sense. It's my brain pulling all the stuff together. Um, so uh, Tracy talked about not the, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Colby talked about lying down in green pastures. And so today I want to talk about leading beside still waters. Um, the, first, the, first, uh, the first thing to note about, uh, well, the first thing about this particular phrase is the promise that he leads you. And um, so... I don't lead myself to still waters, right? I don't lead myself to the place of rest. He leads me to the place of rest. And I'm not the one who determines the place. Think about it this way. I'm not the one who determines the place that I drink. I'm not the one who determines the kind of food that I eat. That requires complete trust that he's leading me. And as a shepherd, the sheep would obviously have complete trust that they were being led into the proper place. So the first thing is he leads me to the place I need to be to receive all that I need, right? I it says, it says, you know, characterizing this in the very first verse, I shall have no wants. Why? Because he leads me and I can trust that he's going to lead me. So he's creating within me this place where he would habitate in my heart and he's going to lead me to the place of watering, the place where I'll find the kind of things that would nourish me. And, and so in that we can, we can learn to rest in him, 
because there's moments of great encounter. There's moments of hyper awareness of his presence. And there's moments where we have no idea where he is. And so when we read Psalm 23, we go, okay, even if I don't know what he's doing, even if he's completely hidden from me, I know he's leading me because that's his promise because he's at work building his home within me. And so even when I'm not perceiving it, and sometimes here's, here's just um, a, little, a little clue. Sometimes the absence of that still watering place is itself the prayer. So when you're going, uh, I feel so desperate for a drink, right? This is, this is David also using this language in, um, in uh, Psalm uh, 40 something, Psalm 42, um, where it says, as a deer pants for water, so my soul longs for you. Right. This is this that kind of that kind of posture is actually the prayer. I'm desperate for a drink. And so we go, I feel so alone. I feel so forlorn. I feel so dry and I feel so empty. That itself turns into the prayer. You offer your emptiness to the father. And because he says, I'll lead you to the place where you need refreshing still waters where you need to drink. So he promises to lead. And the other thing is he doesn't just promise to lead to a any old watering hole any place right you know um i remember uh a number of years ago when i was a teenager and we my family would go camping into in the mountains in california there was a particular campground we used to go to called horse meadow and uh there we went every single year and we'd go for two weeks at a time it was wonderful memories of growing up and there was a hike that we would always go on and it was the hike to go find Salmon Creek Falls. And Salmon Creek Falls was a 400 foot waterfall up in the mountains. You know, we're talking seven, 8,000 foot elevation. You know, not like the, the mountains that East Coasters talk about, but I mean the real mountains. And, uh, and so um, we went on this hike every single year because every single year we always took a wrong turn. And we never made it to Salmon Creek Falls. I've never actually seen Salmon Creek Falls. Every year we'd go on this hike and there was multiple branches and pathways and everything, but it was like the de facto hike out there. And somehow we always got lost. In, not at lost in the, I mean, we could always follow the trail back, but lost in the sense that we missed a mile marker or a turn or something. And, and so I have these distinct memories of always going to look for Salmon Creek Falls. Now, one time my family went and we had a, a whole extended family there it was about 30 of us and i hung out and played with my cousins and the rest and my family went on the hike and finally found salmon creek falls so i'm only one of our family that hasn't seen it um but anyway one one of these times i remember being really far up in the hills and we had run out of water and we were we were um, walking next to a river and you know the, the conventional wisdom says you don't drink from water that you pull out of a river unless the uh unless you boiled it first right well we were out of water we were thirsty and so we were high enough up in the mountain the water wasn't still and it was running fast enough that there was very little danger of the water being dangerous for us because you know you it would have to be still water you know stagnant water not still water stagnant water that was inundated with um you know, maybe cow manure or something like that, that would create the germs and the bacteria in the water that would actually be detrimental for us. So we all filled our water bottles up and we were perfectly fine. And the water was some of the most refreshing, crisp, cold water. I, I remember that so distinctly. So the, the issue of, um, the issue of him leading the sheep to still water is that he's going to lead you to a place where the water is not contaminated and it's drinkable. He's gonna lead you to a place where the water will actually be beneficial to you. Now, I was reading in, the, I have this book. This was Aaron's book growing up. He is my shepherd. And I spent a, there was a, a few years ago, um, probably more like, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. There was, a, there was a time where the Lord was really taking me deep into Psalm 23. Every time I had meditated on Psalm 23, I, I was, it lasted for a couple of months. I just open it up. I'd start reading and I just start weeping at his goodness. 
And uh, I remember reading the first verse and thinking, why do I have so many wants if it says that you're going to fill all my wants? But I can think of a bunch of wants that I have. And that just led me into this whole place of realizing a deeper degree of trust and reliance and him leading me and restoring me and refreshing me, all that stuff. But I just want to read to you, and this, this basically separates each. So I would read this to the kids when Savannah was three, I think Finley was one. And, uh, and I, I would start tearing up as I was reading it to them in this season. And so I've read it to them multiple times. I love this. I love the book and the art. But there's one, the one passage where... It's it where the passage for he leads me to calm waters. Here's the here's the picture of it. it. Says this: Sheep are timid and easily frightened. Rushing streams and noisy bubbling springs of water scare them. When they are thirsty, they would rather drink from disease-filled mud holes. So the shepherd patiently searches for calm, quiet pools of fresh water, where he can lead the sheep to drink in peace. So I did a bit of research and found out that that is um, largely true, that sheep are very hesitant, research meaning I Googled it for an hour or so, so I did not call up a shepherd and investigate, but um, sheep are hesitant to drink from fast running water, uh, and, and a lot of animals are, for fear of falling in, uh, because it's, it can be dangerous. And a sheep who hasn't been, uh, you know, who has all of his wool, it can be very difficult for the sheep to uh, swim in fast running water because the wool gets soaked. If, you know, if the sheep's been shorn, then it's a lot easier for that. Uh, but if the sheep hasn't been, so the sheep are sheep. And like I said, a lot of animals are hesitant to jump into very fast running water. So, so you have to find still water for them to drink, but you know, as well as I do that when you find, when you find still water, like there's a, my brother and I, we used to get onto a, a, um, a little river that was right around the corner from our house. And we had a little spot that we'd go play in. And it was where the water had become still, but that water was stagnant. It was full of moss. There were weeds. It wasn't water you would drink. It was brown. It was murky. It was, it was water that would be very, very detrimental. Not like the water up in the mountain that was closer to the source that we could drink and it was perfectly fine. That water was running like a river. So it's not something a sheep would be able to go to. So, so he, when he says he'll lead you to still waters, he'll lead you to the place where the water itself is refreshing and, and the environmental factors around you are such that you can let go of fear and you can actually dive in and feed yourself or restore yourself. But it doesn't say that, I, I think this is an interesting one. It doesn't say that he's going to cup the water into your mouth. It says he's gonna lead you to the place where you can do that. Now, it's interesting that fear will cause a sheep to drink from the wa wrong water source. But think about that. Fear will cause a sheep to drink, fear will cause almost any animal to drink from the wa wrong water source, unless they're being led. If they're not being led, it's very easy to find a water source that would actually be detrimental to your health. And so, so this is really, to, to me, thinking today, how many people have been inundated with, um, well, we're inundated every day with fear-based messaging when we look at social media, when we look at um, mainstream media, when we look at news, we look at the kind of stories that circulate, the things that go viral, these things germinate fear and, um, and perpetuate fear in our culture. Our culture is addicted to fear today. And fear sells just as much as sex sells, fear sells. And, and it's, it's become a whole industry in and of itself. And now, you know, the, the, uh, sometimes the, the, uh, the therapy industry takes advantage of this, takes advantage of the fear. Well, uh, people are so afraid. And so now let's give them drugs to calm the fear. And, and the fear leads to anxiety, leads to depression, all this kind of stuff. So we live in a day and an age where humankind has always been plagued by fear, but we live in a day and an age where that's been heightened tremendously so. Partly because you can see news stories about what's happening half around, halfway around the world and you can't do anything about it. So 
you're powerless to make the change of towards the thing that you're most afraid of, right? Maybe nuclear war, maybe um, a, a new draft into an army, maybe it's your kids being involved in what's going to happen, whatever it is. It's very easy to fear today. And you see people going to all kinds of watering holes that feed them things that create sickness within them. And they keep going back because they don't know how to get to the place of calm, still water that's helpful for them. They're not being led. And we see that even in the church today. We see, uh, you know, a, a pretty large segment of prophetic ministry trafficking on, trafficking on fear, fear-based prophecies. Well, you know, what's going to happen to the world? Well, here, let me give you all the prophecies about what's going to happen to the world. Well, what about the prophecies that talk us about how good the Father is, how he's leading us, and where he's leading us to drink and to be refreshed from? Not who's going to be the next political leader, not who's going to be, what nation's going to happen to rise up against what nation, not, not what nation's going to have a next great destiny. All, a lot of that kind of stuff is influenced by fear. What's going to happen to our nation? What's going to happen to our money? What's going to happen to our family? What's going to happen to our possessions? People ask these questions and they're afraid. And so prophetic ministry gets in there and hears these questions and answers them unwittingly, I think, because fear has become so predominant. And I'm not, I'm not calling out any particular prophetic ministry in particular. I'm just saying this has permeated our culture and it's permeated our prophetic culture. And it's permeated how we think about being led and who we go to and who we listen to. Well, right here, it says that he's going to lead you to the place of calm stillness. And, you know, it's it's like, it, I don't know if you guys have ever heard the term doom scrolling. Some of us are, um, you know, I think that's something that kids say today, doom scrolling, where you get onto Twitter or social media or a news app or whatever, and you just can't look away. You just keep scrolling and you can't look away. And it's, a, it's totally a thing. People get addicted to the fear-based news cycle. We're so used to it. And we're so inundated with it. And, and so how can you be led? How can you find that place of calm, the calm still waters if all you can see is be afraid, be very afraid? And like I said, the, the, according to the children's book, which I think carries a, a ton of wisdom in there, is if if... I'm dominated by fear, it's going to be very difficult to find the kind of water that he wants to lead me to. It's going to be very difficult to see his leading because I'm looking for a watering hole that actually will be detrimental to my health. And so, so we have to be led by him, which means we have to trust him. And see, when I can trust him, then I can let go of my need to, see, think about it this way too. With, and this is the whole psalm, you know, when he talks about his rod and his staff, they comfort me. The rod, the, and I don't want to get too much into further on, but it actually is pertinent to the still waters section of this. Um, because someone's going to talk about the rod probably while I'm gone in India, and I don't want to steal the thunder. Um, so the, the rod is the thing a shepherd would use to fight off all of the anim the animals that would come to try and it would be there would be poisonous snakes wolves the things that would prey on the sheep the shepherd used a rod which was a you know a yay big thing that was quite heavy and they would either thunk the snakes or throw it at the attacking animals so that the rod was the thing of protection now because the shepherd is protecting me because he's leading me I can go to the waters without fear that I'm going to be attacked from the outside. So I can go to the waters without fear that anything's going to contaminate me on the inside because I'm being led. I can go to the waters and let my guard down because the shepherd's protecting everything around me. This is why he says, when you're in the presence of your enemies, he's going to protect you. I can go to the water and be perfectly fine drinking from the water without having to have my eyes on alert for the next thing that's going to get me. I can finally let go of the fear that dominates the surrounding culture and just be at rest that he's leading me to the place where I can be still and where I can just receive from him. Um, and so that's the still waters thing. So we've got um, the trust of being led. We've got the Holy Spirit habit inhabiting you and creating a home within you. The qualifications of that home are, Psalm, are laid out in Psalm 23. 
We've got the the overwhelming amount of the, the way fear would rob us of that place of um, refreshing water and would could drive us easily to place of uh, water that would contaminate us that would make us sick, make our hearts sick. And we could see that in the surrounding culture, what we give our attention to. And then the other thing is he leads us to still waters to teach us what stillness is like to show us because when I'm when I'm next to the still water. I can see I can begin to see what the climate is like in stillness when things are quiet around me so to be to be still doesn't so much mean to be surrounded by silence, although that's part of it to be still in terms of um, Christian spirituality and formation to be still is to not be moved by external or internal forces. That's what it means to be still. So he brings me to the place of stillness so that in stillness, I'm only led and moved by him. I'm not moved by anything else. And so I learn what it means to be with him in stillness, letting go of fear, letting go of the need to protect, letting go of the need to preserve myself, letting go of the need to grasp onto things, but just perfectly content in the fact that he's capable in leading me to the next thing that I need. And the next thing that I need, and the next thing that I need, and the next thing that I, lead, I need. So I learn by being led by him what stillness is. The early church fathers actually called this the hesychastic lifestyle. Hesychastic means the stillness, life, the, the life of stillness. So this was actually a term and a practice that the early church adopted that we still see today. It's the place of abiding union, where I learn not to be moved by anything. That that the my high my and and this is the thing when when the spirit's making his abode within you and he's leading you to still waters the highs become less high and the lows become less low because i become even in the midst of it because i'm relying on him to lead me and guide me and so i'm not moved so much by praise to pride and i'm not driven to depression by criticism but I can just remain consistent in him because I know he's looking out for me. And then in the midst of it all, when someone criticizes or praises me, it doesn't move my disposition because I'm just with him. And what I do, I live alone to him. The Lord said to me one time, um, uh, Josh, serve me in obscurity. And I said, Lord, what does it mean to be obscure? And he said to me, it means to be not seen by people, but always seen by me. You're obscure to the people around you, but you're never obscure to me. And so I'm always seen by him. And that means that the highs don't have to move me as much and the lows don't have to move me as much because I know he'll be with me in the midst of it. And when I'm low, when I'm depleted, when my energy's out, when I'm empty, that turns into my prayer. And I offer myself, God, I'm empty. That's my prayer, not fill me but i'm empty i recognize my lack well what a beautiful thing to recognize your lack in prayer to recognize how empty you are that's a beautiful thing actually if you consider it you're recognizing just how much you 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 yearn and long for more of his infilling that's a prayer in and of itself coming to grips with that the most of the time we get so uncomfortable with that we want to move right past it and go back to the place of infilling but let me be conscious of the emptiness because that turns into a desire for more of him and it is it actually betrays a deep desire for more of him it says if i can feel empty it means there's something there that's yearning for more and so i can dive into that emptiness and go it no longer it's no longer uncomfortable for me or something i try and avoid about myself i feel empty wonderful i'm going to offer that emptiness to him because it turns into prayer so teaches me stillness by leading me to still waters so that I'm no longer moved by the external forces. I'm not moved by joy or grief or sadness or anger or great pleasure or lust or desire. These things don't move me as much. I'm not saying they're not, you can't have great pleasure or desire or joy. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they don't, they have less impact on my emotional disposition and my willingness to follow the Lord. I'm not saying that they're bad. I'm not saying grief is perfectly fine to process through. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it doesn't diminish my commitment to being led by him and following him. And so I'm still in the midst of being led by him. And so that's what I mean by no longer moves me as much. Like the high doesn't make me more committed and the low doesn't make me less committed. 
I'm just even in the midst of it. I'm not saying you become non-human. Actually, the the Christian spirituality, the, the formative practices call this um, the life of dispassion. That it doesn't mean to not have passion. It means to not be driven by passion. And so, so often we're driven by passion and that determines the level of our service rather than just our simple commitment to seeing him and knowing him. And so uh, lastly, to characterize this a little bit um, before I wind up, I just want to look at a passage in Song of Solomon that I think um, helps us see the juxtaposition between the life of fear and the one who is pursuing being led by the Father. And that's in Song of Solomon chapter 5. Um, I love this, this um, <coughs> part <two coughs> um particular passage in Song of Solomon. And uh, I've talked to Tracy at one point, I'd love to preach a whole, like a five-year sermon series through Song of Solomon. It's, it's just so deep and so rich. Um, but I, just, just starting off at verse two, um, many of you will be familiar with passage or chapter five. It's a very, it's a very popular passage, but I just want to characterize something for you that I think will help us understand how fear tries to intimidate us back to a place of um, uh, almost senility to the spiritual life. Like I'm just totally oblivious of the spiritual life and the beck and the call of the father's heart. So verse two, starting at verse two says this, this is the Shulamite bride speaking. She says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. I was, beautiful language there for my head is covered with dew my locks with the drops of the night and so this is the 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 call of the lord this is the call of jesus this is the beck of the spirit to us as an individual and to us as a corporate church too is is the husband is is uh, in in the context of song of solomon the husband is is solomon but solomon is a picture of the lord and intimacy that the lord has with us the desire for intimacy he has with us and then the Shulamite bride responds in verse three, I've taken off my robe, how can I put it on again? I've washed my feet, how can I defile them? My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door and my heart yearned for him. I arose to open for my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. So one, fear, <clears throat> fear keeps her paralyzed is the first thing. How can I rise again? I've already taken my robe off. I'm unclothed. He'll see everything. My feet will be dirty. She says, right? My, my feet have washed. How can I defile them? So he'll see me for what I am. And that fear keeps her from opening herself up to him. Right? He's already called. And she's already yearning. This is the part of our heart that goes, I'm empty. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to respond. This is what I'm saying. This yearning is part of our heart. Lean into the yearning, the yearning for more of him. When you feel empty and destitute, I don't know how to respond. I don't know what's happening. Because she's going, She her first response is fear. Is uh, He's not going to like what he sees. He's going to see everything. I'm uncovered. And so fear keeps her from engaging. But then she moves past the fear. Right? She, she, the invitation becomes more important than the fear that would hold her back. His, he's right there. He's so beautiful. He's so lovely. I can't help but get up. So um, she goes to verse six, okay? I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone away. My heart leapt when he spoke. So again, the emptiness, the destitute, I don't know where he is, turns into the search and the yearning. Like, just like I was saying. I opened for my beloved, my heart yearned, but he wasn't there anymore. So that convinces her of the heart cry. So now she's dealt with the first stage of fear, that inner fear that she won't be loved by the beloved when he sees her. She's overcome that because his beauty has overwhelmed her. Okay. So my heart leap, left up when he spoke. I sought him and I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen who went about the city, they found me. They struck me and wounded me. The keepers of the wall took my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am lovesick. So love has made her venture outside of herself to find him. Okay, love is the motive. Love is the impetus. She's seen something of him that's beautiful. 
Okay, this is the same. This is the sheep loves and adores the shepherd. And the shepherd goes, I'm going to lead you. And the sheep gives everything to the shepherd. I'm love is the motivation for the journey. Jesus says this in John 14. If you love me, we're going to make our home in you. Okay, love is the motivation for the journey, loving him. Catching of like I've said, I've said this a million times to you guys. Catching a glimpse of his beauty is what initiates the transformative journey. It's what sustains the journey of transformation, and it's the culmination of the tra- the journey of transformation is catching a glimpse of his beauty. It always will be that. Okay, so this is the Shulamite bride is the divine. This is the this not the divine. This is the spouse of the king. Think about how crazy this is. Okay. The, actually, the term for um, the, the the veil that they took away from, that term is a royal garment. So the wife goes out, the Shulamite bride goes out in her royalness into the city to find her husband. And she is turned away and actually viciously attacked by the watchers on the wall and the guardsmen in the city street. Okay. She's caught a glimpse of his beauty. She's realized her royal identity. She goes out in longing passion for him. And she's turned away by the watchers on the wall and the guardsmen in the city. I propose to you that the watchers on the wall, these are the people that are looking into the, into the, um, into the, you know, the fields past the wall to see, you know, where's the next threat coming from. Okay. So I propose to you that these are the people that have been so inundated by fear that they can't see passion right in front of them. And so there's, they just are constantly looking for the next thing to fear the next great thing. Well, the enemy's on the rise and there's, and when there's nothing there, there's going to be something there. There's, we're just going to keep looking until we find the next great thing to fear. This is every political ideology. This is every single motivation. This is, well, look at what they're going to do with your kids in the school. Look at what's going to happen uh, if this person gets elected. Look at what's going to happen if Trudeau gets elected again. Whatever, right? This is whatever it is. This is always looking to the next great thing to fear. It will dominate your attention, and it will keep you from seeing the passionate pursuit that she's so on another wavelength, the bride, because she's caught a glimpse of his beauty, and she's been driven by passion, and she's realized her royal identity. She's so on another wavelength that they can't, like, like, think about this. They can't stand to have her in her midst, in their midst. She, she, by her passion, immediately offends the watchers on the wall because the watchers are always looking for something to fear and they don't know what to do with someone who's finally gripped by passion because fears gripped them, okay? So let passion grip you. Don't let fear grip you. Because fear will drive you to look for what the enemy is doing. She, in her passion, is looking for where the bride, the, her, her groom is, right? The, the presence of the spirit. So the watchers on the wall looking for the next great thing to fear. And the guardsmen in the city making sure everything is ordered. Well, you're, you can't be out here at night. What are you doing? This isn't right. This isn't proper. This is against the rules. And so the guardsmen in the city are those who use force and fear to protect the norm go well you can't go you like you can't show up to church late you can't sit in that seat that's not your seat right well worship went too long well that song was the that song wasn't that good today it's all these things these are the rules that need to be enforced because we're so afraid the rules that say if you act outside of these rules we don't know what to do with you Well, she's been captivated by beauty and nobody around her understands that because she's not following the rules the way they think she should. She's totally misunderstood. But here's the thing. She doesn't care because she's just looking for him. But she even says she moves past the abuse. She moves past the resistance. The ones dominated by fear of what the enemy is going to be doing and the ones dominated by fear that something is not going to work right. Oh, no, we've uh, you're going to you're going to upend the balance but she's seen something she doesn't care she moves past it see this is this is this is to be moved by him and nothing else this is being led by still waters so that stillness is your disposition and the only thing you're moved by is him not the threat of an external enemy not the 
it, the insatiable fear of, well, the water's too fast, so let's go find uh, any old watering hole that might have germs, that might have bacteria that might make us sick. I'm only moved by him. And so he leads us to still waters so that in stillness we'll only be moved by him, not by the watchers on the wall, not by the keepers of the, of the, you know, the, the, the ones that watch out for the next great thing to fear, because it's easy to join them on the wall, by the way, because you find meaning in looking for the next great thing to fear. And you're always looking for the next great thing to fear. And, and there's never enough to fear. It's easy to join those people on the wall. It's easy to be part of the guardsmen in the city saying, well, you're upending the cart. You're not doing it right. This isn't how you're supposed to look. You're not supposed to wear that to church. You know, you're not supposed to dress that way, right? All, all of these things that are kind of the unspoken rules that we're supposed to fulfill. It's easy to be part of those. It's difficult to be the bride. That's difficult because you're misunderstood because people don't, do, people don't know why you do things the way that you do them. You know, people go, well, why didn't you take the job? Why didn't you take the, I was talking with a friend just the other day and he was asked to um, oversee a particular group and he was really uncomfortable in, in the context of his job. It was a diversity, diversity, equity and inclusion group, a DEI group. And, um, and he was really uncomfortable overseeing that. And he said, he prayed and he said, he felt like the father said no. And so he went to his boss and his boss said, well, can you, can we talk about this for five minutes? Well, you're the perfect candidate to oversee this. Why won't you? He's from Africa. And, uh, and he says, well, it'll take me a lot longer than five minutes to explain that to you. Do you have an hour? So he sits down with his boss and describes the whole journey with Jesus. I'm a Christian. I love, and the father told me, no, I prayed about this. Like that sounds crazy, right? It's not easy to be that person. It's absolutely not easy to be that person. And so then his boss said, okay, I love what you've said. His boss, and by the way, his boss was lesbian and been married for 25 years when he said this. His boss so loved what he said, she asked him to chair the next meeting with the CEOs and CFOs that they're working with and run a talk on diversity. And so he shared his faith openly with high, with professional CEOs about and he's like completely out of his element he's like i can't do that and he prays about it and the father says that's the one you're gonna do <laughs> i love that right if fear dominates you you don't find yourself in that position because you have to protect the rules you have to look for the next great fear but if you're being led to the still waters guess what he'll put you in amazing places it'll be it's not always gonna be comfortable it's not always gonna be he, he said, I'm a low level employee. Why are you asking me to do this? He says, I love what you've said. And I think you'd be the perfect person to do this. So he, he did it and it was, he said, it turned out amazing. And um, anyway, I, I just was so proud of him. So, so the, the two thought, this is, that's what I wanted to share with you guys today and just kind of draw all this together. The Holy Spirit's making his abode in you. Just follow him. Don't follow fear. And you'll see the trends all over social media. You'll see the trends all over the news everywhere and just recognize it for what it is oh that's that old fear thing trying to tell me how to think that's that old fear thing telling me oh it's going to be okay you know when it's in context of prophetic ministry the nation's going to be good again or the next elect i now i know who the next political figure is going to be elected so i'm okay no, no no you're not okay because that's been prophesied you're okay because the father's leading you so that's the place we need to be is the place of trust and reliance upon him so the questions I want to leave with you, and and I can repeat these when we actually get to the um, when we actually get to the uh, bring them into the breakout rooms, um, because I would like prayer for India. Um, the The questions I'll leave with you again. I'll I'll repeat these when we actually go to the breakout rooms. Is I want you to spend um, a few moments in the group silently reflecting on the past week. And think of one thing in the past week that moved you to kindness, that moved you to love, that moved you to admiration, generosity. So one, one thing that moved you, whether it was the father, was it something you saw? Because the father works in all kinds of ways. Something that moved you to kindness, generosity, love, admiration, some kind of virtuous um, response, whether it was a, a, you know, a physical response to the person or just you know, something stirred your emotions about that. 
And then, and then think of one thing that moved you in the opposite way, to anger, to greed, to jealousy, to pride. Think of, think of something that moved you in the opposite way, something that moved you to love, admiration, kindness, generosity, and then think of one thing that moved you to anger, greed, jealousy, or pride. And then, and then consider this with, that, with those two questions, how can you see the Father moving you? And how can you see him working in the midst of that? And how can you see the flesh or the world striving with you and trying to get you to see things their way? And what might the Father say to you about both of those things? And so those are those are the questions I want to um, to let linger <coughs> with you. Is in the last week what's moved you to um, love, admiration, kindness, that? In the last week, what's moved you to anger, pride, jealousy, a particular event that happened? Because things are trying to move you in a particular direction. And and Jesus is leading you to this place of stillness where you can just be moved by him and trust in him, right? And so in, in what ways do you see your own flesh responding? In what ways do you see the Father moving you? And what might the Father say about both of those things? And remember, the Father is always good, kind, and tender. And so when he speaks, he speaks lovingly. He doesn't say, oh, you stupid little kid. You don't know what you're doing. That's not how the father speaks. He goes, yeah, I saw that too. That was hard. That's, that's the way the father speaks. And uh, so those, those, those are the questions to linger on.